Good evening. Uh, for some of us, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mariusz Dąbrowski. I am president of the Jerzy Stelmach Eureka Foundation, which deals with interactive education and popularization of the frontal scientific research. Uh, the foundation gathers active scientists and therefore for a couple of days, we offer you the lectures and debates under the project SPIN I Science, uh, session number four entitled Physics, Chemistry, Biology and Psychology. How could life on the other planet look like? The project is a joint undertaking of the associating SPIN, which brings together Polish science centers and is implemented in the years 2021-22. As a part of this cycle, uh, the Eureka Foundation has already organized three sessions on the latest progress in science. The project is co-financed by the Polish Ministry of Education and Science under the Social Responsibility of Science program. And its main task is to bring the achievements of outstanding scientists to the general public. I am pleased to announce that today's lecture will be given by our guest, Professor Paul C. W. Davis, from the Arizona State University, USA. Hello, Professor. Hello. Hello. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, because of the leaf transmission on the YouTube channel, the participants uh, of the lecture and workshops uh, on the Zoom and YouTube uh, will have the microphones and cameras turned off by default. Questions. Uh, can be asked via the chat application in the Zoom program and on the YouTube channel throughout the broadcast as well. Now, let me say a couple of words about the scientific career of our lecturer. Uh, Paul Davis is, first of all, a renowned theoretical physicist and a cosmologist probably best known to the scientific community as a co-author of the textbook entitled Quantum Fields in Curved Space. Sounds uh, very advanced. Uh, first edited in 1982 and a series of papers about gravitational entropy. He is now Regents Professor and Director of the Beyond Center for the fundamental concepts of science, in science, at Arizona State University, Phoenix. His research interests have focused mainly on quantum gravity, early universe cosmology, the quantum uh, theory of black holes, and the nature of time. Paul Davis is also an astrobiologist. He was an early advocate of the theory that life on Earth may have originated on Mars. Besides, for several years, he has been closely involved in cancer research funded by the US National Cancer Institute relating cancer roots with some evolutionary aspects of origin of life on Earth. Paul Davis he is also the best-selling author. This, among others, brought him to become a Templeton Prize winner in 1995 and a member of the Order of Australia. He wrote 31 books. Some of them were also translated into Polish. Uh, I can, you can see on the left uh, some uh, po small poster about it. Among them, uh, the last three minutes, God and new physics, eerie silence. And uh, the last one, what's eating the universe is under print with inauguration on the 24th of March uh, by Copernicus Center Press in Krakow, Poland. You are welcome to join this inauguration. Professor Davis also has 
an asteroid uh, called 1992 OG renamed uh, in his honor. Now, uh, I would like to invite you to the lecture. Uh, Paul, uh, please start your presentation. Uh, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Marius, for that very nice and in, uh, long introduction. Uh, and let me apologize to all our uh, viewers and listeners in Poland for not speaking in Polish. I shall speak in English uh, and I shall try to speak fairly slowly. Uh, I'm talking to you from my home in Arizona, where it's another warm and sunny day. Uh, and uh, as you heard in the introduction, I'm the director of the Beyond Center at Arizona State University, uh, where we uh, split our attention between things like the origin of the universe uh, and the origin of life and astrobiology. Uh, so today I'd like to tell you about my latest thinking uh, in the search for life, and in particular intelligent life, beyond Earth. So I'm now going to share my screen and hope that all will work well. And I think I see what I want to see on my screen, so I hope that's working for you too. Uh, now for the greater part of human history, the question of whether or not we are alone in the universe was dealt with mainly by theologians and uh, philosophers. But in the last few decades, scientists also have been uh, making a contribution to this, uh, this topic. It's one of the oldest and, and deepest questions of existence. Uh, the scientific search for life, intelligent life, beyond Earth began in earnest in 1960 with the pioneering work of an American astronomer, Frank Drake, who uh, began using a radio telescope, you see in the background in this rather old photograph, uh, to sweep the skies in the hope of coming across a radio message from an extraterrestrial civilization. And this is known uh, as SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And uh, it began because in the 1950s, uh, the science of radio astronomy was being established. And it was clear to the astronomers that these big dishes were capable of communicating not just across terrestrial distances, but literally interstellar distances. So that if there are any civilizations out there that have the use of radio, uh, and if they might guess that there is life here on Earth, then they may be sending us messages, in which case all we need to do is to turn our radio telescopes on the right star at the right time uh, to get their message. So it's a thrilling prospect that we might literally be able to enter into radio communication with an extraterrestrial civilization. That's the dream that underpins SETI. Uh, so how are we getting on? Well, some of the biggest telescopes in the world have been used for this quest. This is the Parkes Radio Telescope in Australia. And this one, uh, sadly no longer in use, is, uh, was the world's largest for a long time, the Arecibo Radio Telescope in Puerto Rico. And uh, both of these have been used extensively over the years in the hope of uh, detecting some sort of radio traffic uh, from an extraterrestrial civilization. But uh, after 60 something years of effort, uh, there's been nothing but an eerie silence. Uh, no radio messages received and no sign of any alien radio traffic at all. So uh, what has gone wrong? Are we looking for the wrong thing in the wrong place at the wrong time? Uh, or should we just continue our efforts? Well, um, I should say that Frank Drake, who pioneered this entire subject, is still alive and still active. He's now uh, about 90 years old. Uh, he's still confident that this technique 
will one day be successful. But after uh, many decades of a null result, uh, then it was becoming really difficult to get funding to continue this search. Uh, most of the funding came from private sources and it wasn't really very much. Uh, but the fortunes of this subject called SETI were transformed uh, a few years ago uh, because uh, the gentleman standing on the left in the picture, Yuri Milner, who is um, a Russian, Californian, Israeli businessman, gave a hundred million dollars to the SETI project. And this was announced at a meeting at the Royal Society in London, and you see in the background some familiar uh, figures, Stephen Hawking, and uh, next to him Martin Rees, the Astronomer Royal, and next to him is the uh, now somewhat older Frank Drake. Uh, and this really has been a huge boost uh, to SETI, and I'm on the uh, committee of Breakthrough Listen, uh, and uh, there's a renewed effort to use radio telescopes to, uh, to try to find some sort of alien message. Uh, but I'd like to go back a, a bit in history uh, because the idea that we're not alone in the universe is actually a very ancient one. And this is a famous poem by the Roman poet Lucretius. Uh, and let me just read these uh, words to you very quickly um, uh, because the reasoning, I think, is a familiar one. Uh, so, if atom stocks are inexhaustible, greater than power of living things to count, if nature's same creative power were present too, to throw the atoms into unions exactly as united now, why then confess you must that other worlds exist in other regions of the sky and different tribes of men, kinds of wild beasts? So uh, rather old-fashioned language, but the point that Lucretius is making, and he, he is drawing upon the insights of Greek philosophy and atomism, uh, is that if the whole universe is made of the same atoms in the same, that can come together in the same combinations, then uh, there's nothing magical about living uh, the, the arrangement of atoms that make living organisms on Earth, so you could expect similar things somewhere else. Uh, that doesn't tell you how many or how often or how likely uh, the arrangements of atoms into living things will be, but it uh, underpins the modern idea that the laws of nature are uniform and the universe is vast, and so you might expect if there's nothing miraculous or magical about life, you might expect to find it somewhere else. Now, um, in the more modern era, uh, there was certainly a lot of speculation about life beyond Earth, and Giordano Bruno uh, espoused this idea. He wrote that other worlds have no less virtue nor a nature different from that of our Earth, and so that, like Earth, they should contain animals and inhabitants. Well, as you probably know, Bruno came to an unpleasant end at the hands of the Catholic Church, though my um, theologian colleagues tell me that this was not really because of the life beyond Earth issue, but other heresies. Uh, at the, a little bit later, a number of early scientists were very enthusiastic about the idea of life beyond Earth. So Kepler, for example, had a very curious reasoning that because uh, Earth has a moon and the moon is very useful for us to get around at night, well then Jupiter has four moons, so the purpose of those moons must be to help the, uh, set the inhabitants of Jupiter to get around as well. So um, very sort of curious reasoning. Um, leaping forward now to the more modern scientific era, the end of the 19th century, uh, businessman Percival Lowell uh, built an observatory at Flagstaff in Arizona, uh, which uh, this is about a three-hour drive from where I'm sitting now. Uh, and uh, the, uh, this observatory became famous for two reasons. One is that it is where 
the planet Pluto, what well, was a planet, uh, was discovered. Uh, but somewhat earlier, it's where the expansion of the universe was discovered. Everybody thinks of Edwin Hubble, uh, but the initial work was done by a man called Vesto Slipher, working at this observatory in Flagstaff, starting in 1909. He, he was the one who discovered the redshift of galaxies. But the reason Percival Lau built the observatory was not to study the expanding universe, but uh, he was convinced that uh, the planet Mars was not only had life, but intelligent life. Uh, and he made many maps of the surface of Mars showing these curious uh, lines on the surface that he thought were canals dug by the Martians to bring water from the polar regions to the drier equatorial regions. So uh, he was convinced that Mars is inhabited, although he had no idea other than they would be engineers, no idea what they would be like. And this surely played into the famous story War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells, which was written at just about the same time, um, in which the Martians uh, come, uh, obviously fed up living on a dry, cold planet, come to Earth uh, to take over, and in the original book there, you can see them doing battle with the, the Royal Artillery just outside London. Uh, and uh, then there's a Hollywood remake more recently, a more sort of technological version of the, of the same thing. Well, all this is just science fiction because in the 1970s, NASA sent two spacecraft called Viking to Mars, and what they found was a freeze-dried desert bathed in deadly ultraviolet radiation with highly corrosive uh, surface soil. So uh, a really rather unpleasant place, no sign of any canals or any Martian engineers or really any life of any sort. Though it remains an open question whether Viking did in fact detect uh, some weak uh, biological activity, a microbial activity in the Martian soil. Uh, we shall find out one day whether uh, Mars might just possibly still have life. I'm convinced it did in the past because it was once warm and wet and not unlike the Earth. Uh, but uh, today uh, it's, not, it's not very clear. But of course uh, the solar system, uh, even though it uh, it's, may just possibly harbour microbial life, it won't have any advanced life, as, as uh, far as we know, at least not uh, any advanced life that has arisen here. Uh, but this uh, solar system we know is just one of many, and so now, <coughs> excuse me, uh, missions like uh, the, the Kepler satellite uh, are finding extra solar planets in huge numbers. There are thousands of them now known. And so there is uh, plenty of, as Americans would say, real estate out there on which life uh, could form. Billions of Earth-like planets in our galaxy alone. Uh, but the problem is, we come right back to Lucretius, uh, just because a planet is habitable doesn't mean it is actually inhabited. In order for an Earth-like planet to give rise to life, uh, somehow a mixture of chemicals has to turn into a simple living thing. And we have no idea how that happened or what is the probability. So when I was a student uh, many decades ago, the prevailing view uh, is that life on Earth is a, a freak, a bizarre accident, something that happened only once in the universe. And this sentiment was well captured by Jacques Monod, the Nobel Prize winning biologist uh, who wrote somewhat sexistly in today's language, man at last knows that he is alone in the unfeeling immensity of the universe out of which he emerged only by chance. And Francis Crick, the co-discoverer of the structure of DNA, wrote in a similar vein that life seems almost a miracle so many are the conditions for it to get going. Uh, now in those days, I was a passionate believer in life beyond Earth, not for any scientific reason, but for romantic reasons. And 
one might as well have professed an interest in looking for fairies. It just seemed so absurd that there could be any life beyond Earth. That was just science fiction. And yet 20 years after this, the sentiment had changed. The pendulum had swung, and Christian de Duve, yet another Nobel Prize winning uh, biologist, was able to write that life is almost bound to arise wherever f physical conditions are similar to the Earth. And he had this wonderful phrase that life is a cosmic imperative, that uh, it, it must be able to emerge wherever conditions are suitable. Uh, so what has changed? Well, actually very little had changed because in terms of our understanding of the transition from non-life to life, um, we were really not a lot further forward. It's true that we knew, we know now, the do didn't, we know now of the existence of all these other planets, but I think astronomers assumed that they were there anyway. Um, so we're still very much in the dark about the probability that life will emerge in the right circumstances. Uh, there have been a number of prominent scientists, Stephen Hawking, uh, who used the argument that uh, the universe is so vast that there must surely be life out there somewhere. So uh, uh, Mary Wojtek, who was head of the NASA Astrobiology Program, also says that uh, with all the other planets, uh, it's also vast, surely life must have arisen somewhere. Um, the big problem is, uh, and we go right back to Darwin, um, Darwin wrote, it is mere rubbish thinking at present of the origin of life, one might as well think of the origin of matter. And I think the point is, if you know the process that turned non-life into life, then you can try to estimate the probability. Uh, but we don't know what that process was, and it's impossible to estimate the probability of an unknown process. It's such a very important basic scientific point, and yet um, many times I'm asked by journalists, and indeed other scientists, well, how likely is it that there's life out there? Well, of course, it's an unanswerable question. Uh, and I always say, well, if you tell me how life began, I can uh, guess uh, what the numbers are. But of course, they can't tell me. And so it remains an open question as to whether the origin of life is a bizarre freak accident that is exceedingly rare and maybe happened only once in the observable universe, or whether it occurs uh, all over the place, whether uh, the universe is teeming with life. It could be either, and it seems a bit pointless to uh, argue these things on philosophical grounds when the best thing we can do is use astronomy uh, and uh, space exploration to try to find the answer. Let's see if there is life out there. So let me come back to this uh, SETI quest. Uh, is it a, su a surprise that we haven't heard from the aliens yet? Well, it, it isn't really. Uh, if you ask Frank Drake, who is surely the world's greatest SETI expert and optimist, uh, what is, in his view, uh, in the, his wildest dreams, uh, his best hope for how close uh, a communicating alien civilization might be. Uh, he says, well, a few hundred light years. So let's just take uh, a thousand light years as a round figure. Uh, so if there's an alien civilization a thousand light years away, we know that uh, it could have been around for millions and millions of years. Uh, they could have something much better than the James Webb telescope uh, they could be observing Earth in such detail that they would know there is intelligent life here. How would they know that? Well, they might see the Great Wall of China, for example, or they might see signs of agriculture. Uh, there are a number of things they, they would see. But now remember, nothing goes faster than light. So if they're a thousand light years away, they don't see Earth as it is today. They wouldn't see our city lights and they wouldn't uh, pick up our radio signals. Uh, but they would see uh, the Great Wall of China, it was there a thousand years ago, and they'd see agriculture. Um, and they might think, well, Earth is a good planet to send radio signals to, but they would surely wait until they know that we have radio technology. 
and our own radio signals have so far only gone about 100 light years out into space. Uh, it's interesting to realize that we can't get them back. Uh, whatever we do, those radio signals are going to travel out across the galaxy. And if there's anybody with a large enough radio telescope pointed our way, they're going to pick those signals up. And if they're a thousand light years away, in about another 900 years, uh, these aliens, hypothetical aliens, will know that we're here, that we have radio technology, and we could communicate. And their message would then take another thousand years to reach us. So uh, radio SETI seems like a good idea, but it seems like a couple of millennia uh, too soon to be doing it. Um, but nevertheless, it uh, doesn't cost a great deal of money, so I think we should carry on trying. But of course, we don't have to pick up a message from the aliens to answer the question, are we alone in the universe? We merely need to have some sort of evidence for non-human technology. Uh, and so we can ask the question, is there anything out there that could not have occurred naturally, that is, without being engineered or designed, uh, and it's not made by humans. And that could be anything at all. Uh, it doesn't have to be a radio signal. So we can now uh, broaden the search to what has become known as, uh, in general, as techno-signatures. I'll say that again. Techno-signatures is the modern way of talking about evidence for non-human technology. Uh, now, techno signatures could come in a, a variety of different ways. Uh, any sort of alien technology would have to make use of resources, uh, would have to ha have some element of design, and it would have to be paid for somehow, either with energy or money or, or both. Uh, and there would be an output of some sort. Uh, and when you make anything, it's just basic laws of physics, there are always waste products as well. And any of these could provide a techno-signature. You might find that there's something missing that should be there, uh, and the, like um, uh, you know, some scarce uh, mineral, uh, or you, you might find that there is uh, things that are dumped which uh, shouldn't be there. That would be your waste. Um, uh, and irrespective of actually detecting the output. So all of these things we could look for. Now, if you saw something like this, obviously, uh, you would pay a lot of attention. I think a, a discovery of that nature would certainly make the front page of uh, our newspapers, as would something like this. Uh, I think there's, this is, uh, as we say in English, open and shut. There would be no real argument about this being technology uh, and indeed non-human technology at this time. Um, but... Um, uh, rather more realistic uh, is what is uh, sometimes called a Dyson sphere, uh, and this is an idea of Freeman Dyson, the famous physicist and futurist, who in 1960, uh, about the time SETI was beginning, uh, realized that if there was a civilization that had been around for many, many millions of years, uh, their energy demands would have become so great uh, that they might surround their host star with a shell of material to trap all of the heat and light coming from it. Uh, so here on Earth, about two billionths of the sun's energy hits the Earth, and of that, only some tiny fraction is harnessed by solar power. But if we fast forward uh, 10 or 20 million years or something on Earth, uh, we might uh, require something ambitious like this uh, Dyson sphere. And the point about that is that uh, they're rather easy to spot because here you would have uh, an object which would glow very fiercely in the infrared part of the spectrum. And people have looked for Dyson spheres. They haven't found them. Um, one uh, place you might look is where not in uh, old uh, stars or old planetary systems, but young planetary systems, because if you have a space-faring advanced civilization, it would make more sense for them to move in to a forming planetary system and create the Dyson sphere before the planets formed, rather than, than taking the planets apart and turning them into a, a sphere. 
Well, these are obviously very futuristic and some people might think crazy ideas, but in this uh, subject of SETI, it pays to remember that our planet is only about one third as old as the universe. There were stars and planets around long before Earth even existed. So if life does arise readily, and if intelligence evolves on some significant fraction of planets with life, then we could expect advanced civilizations uh, to have been present uh, billions of years ago. And uh, billions of years is a long time uh, to be able to carry out ambitious astro engineering projects. Uh, a few years ago, there was a flurry of excitement that maybe a Dyson sphere had been discovered. Um, uh, this was a discovery made by Tabitha Boyan uh, using the uh, data from the Kepler telescope. And it's a star uh, that undergoes very peculiar changes in its luminosity. And some uh, artists uh, became carried away and drew all sorts of wonderful looking uh, imaginary pictures as to what this system might be. And the question is, was it some form of alien megastructure or was it uh, uh, you know, just um, a swarm of comets or some dust between us and that star? And all these things have been looked at. And I have to say um, that although the astrobiology community is very skeptical, that uh, this particular star uh, is uh, uh, something like a Dyson sphere or an alien engineering project of some sort, um, it's not been completely ruled out. It's not uh, totally satisfactorily understood at this time. Um, then, uh, this being a lecture uh, in uh, Poland, I thought I must mention this uh, star, uh, but I'm afraid I cannot pronounce this name properly, but something like um, and uh, he was a Polish-Australian astronomer uh, who discovered a very peculiar star uh, quite some years ago uh, that has not uh, just the usual elements, but all these radioactive uh, elements, including some that are transuranium. That is, they are beyond, they're heavier than even than uranium. They don't occur naturally on Earth. Uh, and so it's a bit of a mystery as to what is going on in this star. And if you wanted to be very speculative, you might think, well, is this some sort of alien nuclear industry? Is this the waste product I was talking about earlier? Is this some sort of um, manufacturing uh, part of the galaxy? Uh, is it an attempt at SETI? Uh, if you dump these weird elements in your star, then it may attract attention. Uh, and in my frivolous moments, I think, well, is this some student project that just went wrong? Um, well, uh, who knows? Uh, but this is the type of thing I mean when I'm talking about um, a techno signature. Uh, let's not uh, be too obsessed with radio signals. Let's think about looking for all of these oddities uh, that might indicate the, um, the existence of non-human technology. I haven't given up on radio, radio entirely because there's another type of uh, way of signaling. Uh, there are, uh, the um, original SETI was based on the idea that the aliens would be deliberately sending messages at us. But of course, um, if you think about a lighthouse, a lighthouse is a way of sending a message, but it's not directed at a particular ship. It just sweeps the horizon, and if there's anybody out there, then uh, they will pick it up. Uh, and so uh, the same principle could occur in the galaxy. You can imagine an ancient civilization near the center of the galaxy sending out a laser beam or a radio beam uh, that would rotate, would sweep around the galaxy and come back uh, every few weeks or months, something like that. Uh, and we could look for such a thing. So this is not really a message directed at Earth. It's just a beacon. And um, curiously enough, back in 1977, uh, a, a powerful transient signal was discovered. It's called the WOW signal because the um, astronomer who discovered this signal, this pulse uh, in the radio um, 
uh, record from a particular radio telescope called the Big Ear Telescope in uh, Ohio, uh, wrote WOW in the margin. Uh, and it's not really been explained uh, since, nor has anybody heard anything else from that part of the sky. Uh, so we just don't know whether this is an unusual transient astronomical phenomenon or whether it really was some sort of uh, radio beacon. It's very expensive to find out because you could direct a radio telescope at this part of the sky and leave it there for 10 years uh, and uh, you know to see if this uh, signal repeats. Uh, but that's a very expensive thing to do and, um, and so we, don't, we just don't know, it's a mystery. Now let me just turn to an argument that is often used. This is uh, Enrico Fermi, the famous uh, physicist, who uh, back in uh, the 1940s uh, was um, famous for uh, asking the question, well, where are all the aliens? And his reasoning uh, was that, as I've mentioned, the galaxy is uh, very old, billions of years old. Uh, it's been around um, a lot longer than the Earth. Uh, if there is intelligent life, and if at least some fraction of civilizations are expansionary, like human beings, they want to explore their universe, they want to colonize other planets, then there's been plenty of time, even at the slow speeds of, of, to, of human rockets, to be able to spread across the galaxy uh, by now, bef before uh, human civilization. And yet they're not here. They didn't come. Uh, and so he asked the question, where are they? And so he worked on the basis that if um, if intelligent life and expansionary civilizations are really likely to occur, then already uh, Earth would, would be overrun with these aliens. Uh, and he said they're not, and so therefore he deduced they weren't there at all. Um, and you can tell Enrico Fermi is famous because you'll see him here on an American postage stamp. Um, he worked on the Manhattan Project, Italian, uh, uh, worked on the Manhattan Project uh, during the Second World War. Um, well, some people say, well, Fermi got it wrong, they are here. Uh, what about all those UFO uh, sightings? Um, and uh, in, in recent months, we uh, the terminology has changed, uh, and people now talk about unexplained aerial phenomena rather than flying objects, so UAPs but I know them as UFOs. And so uh, what, what about those? Can we take, take that seriously? Um, and uh, if so, what should we uh, do about it? Well, uh, is it the case? Could it be, as many people claim, that aliens are in fact zooming around uh, in, in the skies above our heads? Uh, can we take it seriously? Well, um, until very recently, very few scientists and uh, very few governments did take it seriously. There have been a number of projects and so on. Um, but just uh, a few months ago, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence in the United States delivered to Congress a report on these unidentified aerial phenomena. And as a result of that, the US government is setting up a, a permanent office uh, to consider some of the reports, a lot of which look very puzzling, uh, and some people are taking it uh, really seriously, and among these people is um, the astronomer R.V. Loeb at Harvard University, who's created the Galileo Project, and he persuaded me to join this, as a well-wisher at least, um, and the plan of the Galileo Project is to try to finally understand what lies behind these pesky US UFO stories. And so this is the project goal. Let me read this out to you, because it's quite important. It's a different from SETI. Um, the goal of the Galileo project is to bring the search for extraterrestrial technological signatures of extraterrestrial technological civilizations, a bit of a mouthful, from accidental or anecdotal observations and legends to the mainstream of transparent, validated, and systematic scientific research. Okay, that's uh, that part. 
and this is the important part, this ground-based project is complementary to traditional SETI in that it searches for physical objects and not electromagnetic signals associated with extraterrestrial technological equipment. That's a, a very long-winded way of saying, forget the radio signals, let's look for chunks of metal or weird stuff lying around in the solar system that is of non-human origin. So that's, uh, again, techno-signatures, um, but uh, uh, of a non-radio type. Now, I'm very skeptical, although I'm part of this Galileo project, very skeptical about these UFO stories for a very simple reason. That, as I've explained, Earth has been around uh, for four and a half billion years. There's been life here for three and a half billion years at least. And I would find it very peculiar if the aliens uh, decided to show up just in the last uh, hundred years or thousand years or whatever it is, just as um, a humanity has evolved on Earth. I, like Fermi, would think um, that if there really are lots of these aliens, they would have been here a very long time ago. It seems sort of inconceivable they would show up just now. Um, but who knows? Um, I think we have to take a longer view, uh, and let's take a hundred million year view. It's not impossible, if there are alien civilizations, that there could be uh, hardware uh, or signs, signatures, left uh, if they had come to the solar system. So if there was alien technology here, um, there are things we might look for. For example, uh, buried nuclear waste, uh, large-scale quarrying or mining, uh, or biotechnology would all leave traces that would last for a hundred million years. Uh, as you well know, we bury our nuclear waste now. People worry about this uh, lasting for millions and millions of years. Uh, if it's there, we could in principle find it. If you found a chunk of plutonium uh, on the moon, uh, say, or on Mars, uh, that, that would be a giveaway because plutonium doesn't occur naturally uh, uh, after this length of time. Um, or if you saw an asteroid uh, terraced by mining operations like that, that would be another example. Um, and uh, recently, uh, it's not just a matter of uh, looking at uh, asteroids or, or the surface of Mars or something. Um, it's been found that there are a number of objects, sometimes called Trojans. Uh, these are small asteroids that are following the Earth as it goes around the Sun. They're locked in the same orbit as Earth. Um, and uh, sometimes these are called lurkers, and it's been suggested that if you wanted to observe the Earth, the aliens wanted to set up a base somewhere, that would be a great place to do it. Um, I, I myself, just to show that even though I'm extremely skeptical, I'm prepared to consider things, many years ago, well, uh, 10 years ago, uh, with a, a student here at Arizona State University, we wrote a paper on searching for alien artifacts on the moon because the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is a satellite, is mapping the Moon to the resolution of half a meter. And this satellite, uh, the pictures from that satellite, satellite are free on the internet, um, and uh, that satellite has indeed discovered technology on the Moon, but so far it's all been human technology. But if a uh, hundred million years ago the aliens had been uh, on the moon, if there was an alien probe or any technology or any sort of expedition uh, and things have been left behind, we might still be able to detect that in these pictures. So it gives an example of the type of thing we could do. Um, and like Freeman Dyson, I believe uh, in this very speculative area, you should just do what you can do. If it doesn't cost much money, you might as well do it anyway. Uh, and because the moon is being mapped, it costs you really nothing to look at the pictures to see if there's anything peculiar, and, and indeed people do. Uh, mostly they're looking for, for lava tubes, they're not looking for crashed spacecraft, but you would see it if it was there. Um, there's another possibility of the same nature, that uh, the solar system was visited uh, a long time ago, 500 million years or something, and that the aliens left behind them like a message in a bottle. You, that's something you leave. It's not a message for any particular person, just anybody who finds it. And what a better, what better place to do this 
um, than in DNA, uh, because the bottle, uh, in this case, would be living cells, and the message would be written into the four-letter alphabet of DNA. Uh, we can do this. Um, Craig Venter, uh, who uh, helped sequence the human genome, is famous for putting his email address in uh, the genome of a bacterium, and some poetry as well, well, and the quotation from Richard Feynman. So we can do this with gene editing. We can put messages in DNA. Uh, maybe the aliens could do that as well. Uh, and uh, once again, uh, DNA is being sequenced anyway. It's free on the internet. Anybody can look for a message. So this is sometimes called genomic SETI. And it may say no more than Earth was visited 500 million years ago by um, an alien uh, expedition or alien technology uh, that left a message for us encoded in the DNA. The message is uh, not out there, it's literally inside us. Uh, we don't actually have to pick up a message uh, to be able to deduce uh, that some sort of um, tinkering had taken place, that, that, the, um, that aliens uh, might have altered the genomes in such a way that from the tree of life, you can tell that there was some sort of major event 500 million years ago or 100 million years ago. You make up whatever number you want. So because we can reconstruct the tree of, the tree of life from uh, gene sequencing, it's called phylostratigraphy, uh, we could spot if there had been any sort of meddling or interference with the evolutionary process. That would be there in the genetic record. So these are all ways we could look in our cosmic neighborhood for, um, uh, for uh, techno-signatures. I'm just going to finish by asking what would ET be like, because I think a lot of people have this Hollywood version uh, that we'd be dealing with, you know, flesh and blood beings uh, uh, that might look something like us. But that, of course, is um, largely for reasons of, of cost when making movies. Um, uh, it, it's very clear, to, to me at least, that here on Earth, um, when we talk about the I in SETI, that's intelligence, that intelligence on Earth is increasingly being outsourced to machines, we call them computers if you like, or artificial intelligence, um, but we know that these, uh, this AI um, is better at chess and even Go than we are, certainly better at arithmetic, um, can fly planes and increasingly make important uh, judgments. So here in, uh, in Arizona, in Phoenix, we have lots of self-driving cars around uh, being tested by Uber and other companies, uh, a familiar sight. Um, and so imagine now that in a million years, uh, how far this will have gone. I think when it comes to space exploration, almost certainly uh, this would be conducted by artificial intelligence or robots we don't really have a term that describes the type of system that I'm talking about, but it is designed intelligence, not evolved intelligence. Um, these are the sorts of images, again, you get from Hollywood, we could call this post-biological intelligence. Um, but I like to think that uh, eventually the, uh, that uh, this type of intelligence, because it can be networked, just like we have the World Wide Web. Imagine the World Wide Web became so developed that our whole planet was devoted uh, to information processing. Uh, then the intellectual power of a planet-wide network of information processing would be uh, incomparable. Um, and uh, why is there a, a, a Warsaw taxi uh, shown uh, back to front? I'm afraid I got it a bit wrong with Photoshop yesterday, I apologize. Um, I wanted to customize this uh, for the talk today. Um, the reason I'm showing the taxi is because uh, the great hope in information processing, I'm sure uh, you will know about this, is uh, the quantum computer. The computing will be transformed uh, exponentially by, in a few years, by the development of quantum computers. And a quantum computer is just a few hundred atoms entangled together would have more computational power than the whole of the World Wide Web does at the moment. And this 
system might be no bigger than a Warsaw taxi. And so uh, uh, my uh, colleague here at ASU, Frank Wilczek, he spends part of the year at ASU, in fact, he's uh, here today, um, has called this quintelligence, quantum intelligence. Uh, and uh, in a way, it's rather depressing because if civilizations hand over the intellectual heavy lifting to designed intelligence, post-biological or artificial intelligence, and that becomes quantum intelligence, uh, then uh, the system might be no, uh, no bigger than a taxi and it pays to go somewhere cold like the intergalactic spaces. And the techno signature from something like that would be almost impossible for us to detect. And so uh, this is a rather depressing finish to my talk because it says that intelligence evolves biologically, it then gets replaced by designed intelligence that then um, becomes so powerful that it loses interest in the rest of the universe and retreats into its own uh, little uh, mental space. In which case, uh, we may never know the answer to the question, are we alone? And even if we did manage to contact one of these godlike super brains, we probably uh, couldn't converse with it in any way because its intellectual power would be so, so much greater than ours. So why do we do this thing called SETI? Is it a complete waste of time uh, given the chances of success? Uh, it's a needle in a haystack search without any guarantee that there's even a needle there. I think the reason we do it is summarized uh, best by Frank Drake himself, who said that SETI is really a search for us. It's a search for ourselves, who we are and where we fit into the universe. And I think that's a, a great place for me to stop and I'm now very happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul, for this uh, very wonderful lecture. Uh, we have uh, at least one question uh, at the moment. Uh, the question is the following. What if the aliens do not have technology as we have? Will we still be able to find them? <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, vice yes. kind of a question. Yes. That, that's, of course, a very familiar question. Um, uh, the, it's often said with uh, Radio SETI uh, that it's really not a search for extraterrestrial intelligence. It's really a search for extraterrestrial radio telescopes. And, of course, uh, we need only think of the dolphins, our fellow uh, creatures on this planet, um, uh, probably... Uh, wonderfully intelligent in their own way and we have a lot of trouble communicating with them and they don't build radio telescopes and so we can imagine a water world that has really very advanced um, uh, animals who uh, might have great thoughts and have uh, amazing philosophers um, but don't don't build any sort of technology that we could ever detect and then the question uh, really becomes uh, can we detect the existence at least of life uh, outside of our solar system? And, and there, it's a mixed story. The hope is that the James Webb Telescope, once it becomes functional in a few months, uh, will have the capability of detecting uh, some chemicals in the atmospheres of other planets that might be a clue to life. And I say might, uh, people think of oxygen as the obvious example that's been made on Earth by life, by plants. Um, and so if we find oxygen on another planet, would that be a sign of life? But unfortunately, it's not that simple. Uh, and so finding life outside of the solar system is a great challenge, uh, but it's one that a lot of people are taking seriously. Thank you very much. We have one more. Uh, what is your opinion on Avi Lepp's uh, hypothesis that uh, Uma Uma is an alien artifact. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, I, I, I myself don't take that very seriously. I should explain to people who don't know what we're talking about um, that uh, for hundreds of years, astronomers uh, have wondered whether we might see a comet or an asteroid uh, moving on an orbit that indicates it comes from outside of our solar system. And again, when I was a student, it was thought puzzling that all the comets that uh, we see and have been tracked all come from within the solar system. If other stars exist and other planets, 
you know, surely they should, there should be comments there too, and some of them would come our way. Um, well, uh, just in the last few years, two have come our way. Um, the terminology is a little confusing because, you know, a comet, an asteroid, but uh, anyway, there are two objects um, that have come into the solar system from uh, another planetary system. Um, and the first of these is called Oumuamua, was discovered in Hawaii, and that's a, a, a local... Uh, oh, that tells me I should stop speaking. Uh, that comes from um, uh, their language. And uh, Avi Loeb at Harvard has... Uh, well, he was... Everybody's puzzled by this object because it had a very strange shape uh, that you might expect if it's a chunk of rock, it should be sort of roughly round. Um, but that's not necessarily the case. It could be eroded to form a more like a flat sheet. Uh, but anyway, he, he says, Avi Loeb says, that you know perhaps it was alien space junk or something like that. Uh, and this Project Galileo uh, has two functions. One is uh, to try to use new types of telescopes uh, to, to track and, f and preferably photograph in high resolution these UAPs or UFOs um, if, uh, if they're lucky enough for one to fly past such a telescope. Uh, but the other is to look for interstellar, more interstellar objects. There should be more. There are estimates at about 30 or so should be in the solar system at any given time. Uh, it's just that they're difficult to, to spot. Okay, there is another one. And the second question, would you say that the alleged detection of phosphine on Venus has uh, been cons conclusively disproven? Yes, um, I, uh, so again, uh, uh, the people watching this may not know, but there was a, a report, a paper published about three years ago, I think, uh, of this uh, curious chemical phosphine that I confess I'd never heard of before, um, uh, that uh, was found in the uh, atmosphere of uh, Venus. Did that indicate um, some sort of um, uh, ecosystem high up in, in the clouds of Venus. You know, Venus is incredibly hot and not a good place uh, to live. Uh, but up in the clouds, it's not impossible that there is some sort of bacterial um, uh, uh, ecosystem. And could this be a signature of it? Um, uh, my impression is that, uh, that, the, um, that the observations were probably flawed. Uh, I'm not an expert on this. Um, and the critics I have spoken to have uh, divided into those who say, well, phosphine is easy to make, we could imagine uh, other mechanisms, and those who say it wasn't phosphine at all. And I'm just not an expert on the, um, on the spectroscopy to be able to offer an opinion. Thank you very much. Uh, I have my personal question. <laughs> uh, simple, related to Drake's formula, okay. Uh, Okay, the, the probability is small, but uh, in fact, uh, isn't it kind of a step function? Uh, once uh, we don't know anything, it's close to zero or, or just zero. Uh, but once uh, we were facing uh, uh, aliens in reality, uh, like discovering of gravitational waves, for example, between, before and after, isn't it uh, then uh, just one? So uh, once we discover that uh, there are aliens, there is no point in even speculating. <laughs> uh, well, I think, I think you're right. It was uh, remarked to me many years ago uh, that either uh, the aliens are nowhere or they're everywhere. And there's a very simple reason for that, uh, which I think most scientists could understand, that the, um, the process is that produce the number of potential Earth-like planets. So if we think about um, the region of space, this Hubble volume we call it, the region of space that uh, is accessible with our telescopes, there are about 10 to the power 23 uh, planets. Uh, and so, you know, could take 10 to the 22 Earth-like, say, within that volume, that's a, that's a very large number. Um, and the, the distances and the number and all those things are determined by gravitation and electromagnetism 
and uh, the, uh, the initial conditions of the Big Bang and dark matter and dark energy, and all of those things in astrophysics that people like to uh, talk about. Uh, when it comes to uh, life, and in particular intelligent life, the processes that determine that are um, complex chemistry and um, ge geophysical conditions and so on, and then uh, the dynamics of Darwinian evolution. Uh, and those are completely different processes. So the, the things that determine the number of habitable planets and the things that determine how life uh, arises and evolves have nothing to do with each other. They're uncorrelated. So it would be a huge coincidence if the numbers happen to match. Uh, it's either one's going to be very much bigger than the other or very much smaller. Uh, to say, well, a galaxy like ours you know, will have 20% or something in, inhabited would seem an extraordinary coincidence. Uh, so I think that idea that it's a step function is, is probably right. And people often ask me, well, what do I hope? What would I like to believe? And I really would love to believe that the universe is teeming with life and that the emergence of, of not only just intelligence, but beings like us who can understand the universe, the com comprehension, that this is somehow built into the nature of the cosmos, that we are um, the products of a deeply bio-friendly, even mind-friendly universe. But that's really a religious uh, position or a philosophical position. It's not a scientific position, but that's what I'd like to believe. Thank you. We have another one. What do you think will come first? The discovery of non-intelligent extraterrestrial life, harder to detect, or detection of much rare intelligence because it should be easier to find and confirm? Yes, the, the question is uh, absolutely right. It, it is easier. Um, uh, let's go back to radio. SETI, for example, although I've been a bit negative about it, um, a, a radio telescope here on Earth could pick up a signal from an alien civilization uh, anywhere in the galaxy uh, that if it's directed towards us. And so uh, it, you can search many more uh, potential sites than you can uh, by just looking, say, for microbial life. In fact, with microbial life, the, we can only directly search within our solar system. And so uh, Mars remains the best hope. Um, but as you hinted in your opening remarks, um, I've long been an advocate of uh, the idea that life on Earth may have originated on Mars for the simple reason that Earth and Mars exchange rocks all the time. We have about a dozen Mars meteorites at Arizona State University in our world-famous collection. And uh, there are many known um, around the world. So Mars rocks come here to Earth a lot, and uh, Earth rocks occasionally go to Mars as well. And we know that microbes can survive that journey. And so I think there's a good chance that we will go to Mars and find there is or was life there, but it would just be the same life as here on Earth, and we would be no further forward in looking for that crucial second genesis. That's what we need to find. We need to see that life has happened more than once to uh, conclude that it is uh, everywhere. And that uh, we, may, may go, we may find the only life in the solar system beyond Earth is on Mars and it's the same life. And that would be very disappointing. And so in that case, I would pin my hopes more on finding intelligent life than on, on uh, microbial life. Thank you very much, Paul. I cannot see more questions. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, your participation, for pa the participation of everybody uh, in this lecture. Uh, I invite uh, especially Polish-speaking um, persons uh, to attend uh, our following three days uh, lectures and debates on some aspects of life on Earth, uh, and in space, or biological, also social, philosophical, and psychological. Uh, also, I would uh, mention, would like to mention that uh, we announced a context a contest for the school students uh, about uh, how do you imagine aliens and cosmic animals. Uh, this is a contest for the. Uh, the picture uh, 
prepared for, for some piece of art prepared, and we have lots of uh, submissions. So this contest will be uh, actually um, finally uh, summarized on Saturday. So uh, I would like to tell you that there will be a lecture tomorrow about the biological, um, the, te the physical determinants of the biological life on Earth. There will be a dispute uh, debate about uh, um, uh, some uh, aspects of uh, uh, extraterrestrial life, as I said, in, in the context of sociology, uh, philosophy, and uh, psychology, even theology. Uh, so uh, uh, please visit our webpage. Uh, it is uh, um, fundacja-eureka.edu.pl. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for uh, your attendance. Uh, um, have a nice evening, nice uh, day, uh, nice afternoon uh, worldwide. Thank you very much, Paul, again for uh, your uh, lecture, and uh, see you soon. Thank you very yes, much. It's been a, been a great pleasure, and I look forward to seeing you in person when this uh, dreadful COVID has gone away for good. <laughs> Hopefully soon. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Bye bye. Goodbye.